2019, 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023. Back to the championship game again and again and again and again. Yes, the KC Chiefs are making their fifth straight appearance in the AF Championship game. They will be contending or vying for that spot in the Super Bowl for the AFC, playing the Cincinnati Bengals with Joe Burrow at the helm. It should be an exciting contest. We'll be talking a little bit about the KC Chiefs, but more I'd like to hit on the Oakland A's of the early 70s. Their dynasty that is often overlooked by baseball people and baseball fans. And I think you'll enjoy what I've uncovered. This is Willow Tool for Park Ridge Sports History. As usual, I'd like to thank Howard Frederick for producing the show, but also inviting me. <laughs> I want to thank the audience for inviting me into their homes. And as I always state, uh, I want to just tell you that this is not off topic, what I'm going to talk about. But what is off topic is occasionally things that I bring up. And as I always constantly say, it's like us being at a bar, celebrating a big softball victory and uh, having a couple of beers and a hamburger and talking all things sports. And one thing leads into another. So I hope you can follow my misdirections and my detours on what I'd like to uncover. First, I'd like to send a shout out to the Kansas City Chiefs and Pat Mahomes. Now, I'm not a big big Chiefs fan, but I, as I've grown older and older, I do appreciate, number one, the old AFL teams more and more. And of course, those AFL teams comprised by the Oakland Raiders, not the Las Vegas Raiders, the Kansas City Chiefs, who used to be in Dallas playing as the Dallas Texans, the Houston Oilers, now the Tennessee Titans, the uh, San Diego, well, actually the Los Angeles, then San Diego, now back to the LA Chargers. And of course, uh, the New York Jets, who used to be the New York Titans, but now that name has been taken by the Tennessee Titans, who used to be the Houston Oilers. But I do love the old AFL, and uh, I, I just want to have an opportunity to reminisce about them. Uh, Kansas City is really a throwback team. Uh, anybody who grew up watching the AFL, before it became the AFC, when it merged with the NFL, uh, will remember they had some great players, Buck Buchanan, Len Dawson, uh, Otis Taylor, of course. And of course, they won Super Bowl IV when they annihilated the Minnesota Vikings. I don't see how anybody, if you've watched the replays of that game, you just know that they manhandled uh, the Purple People Eaters, the Minnesota defense, and really Joe Cap and the Minnesota Vikings in that game. And, of course, it was highlighted by uh, Len Dawson's uh, little pitch and throw, uh, catch and throw to Otis Taylor, who just galloped. I mean galloped, because if you see the last 10, 15 yards of that run, you can tell that he was just blessed with just superhuman running speed. <laughs> and he was a really, excuse me, really good wide receiver. Anyway, the Chiefs with Mahomes at the helm, have now gone into their fifth Super Bowl and uh, fifth uh, AFC championship game. And of course, they've played the Bengals already. They've played the Buffalo Bills. They lost to the New England Patriots. And that got me thinking a little bit. Two things. One is, when was the last time that a team actually accomplished this? Well, they didn't have to really go back that far. New England, with, of course, Brady Belichick under the ownership of Robert Kraft, they went to eight straight champion. I mean, that's just unbelievable. I, I, I can't even believe that. How many championships, even the Packers didn't go that many in a row, let alone to the number of, of Super Bowls, which is why so many people feel that Belichick, perhaps the greatest quarterback post Vince Lombardi, you can make that argument, and that Brady is the GOAT of football history. Uh, all I got to do is this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Not too many other <laughs> players in the NFL can state that. Seven Super Bowls. And, of course, he was denied an eighth, and he'll probably be looking for another place. So I went back and realized that. Then I went back, and this will make Jet fans a little bit happy since their season kind of ended such uh, on a bum note. Do you realize the last time that the AFC did not have as a participant the New England Patriots or Kansas City? 
You have to go all the way back to 2010 when the Steelers and the Jets met up. And again, Jets in 82, Jets in 2010 just came up a little short of returning to the Super Bowl. Where if you've ever seen that game, the uh, 69 Super Bowl of the Jets against the Colts, if you're rooting for the Jets, it's a nail biter. If you're rooting for the Colts, it's frustrating to watch. But that game was actually better. And I, I really do urge football fans who thought that the game was boring. I just remember uh, recalling a lot of people thinking that the game was boring because there wasn't a lot of offense. There was a lot of tension in that game. And of course, uh, Joe Namath has the guarantee, guarantees the victory, comes through, does not complete a pass, nor does he throw a pass in the fourth quarter as the Jets just churned out yards uh, via the running game and just ate up clock, valuable clock, leaving Johnny Unitas basically with about three, four minutes to try to take a 16-point deficit into a win. And, of course, it comes up short. Well, these Chiefs are pretty exciting. Uh, overall, of course, I don't know how the, how this is working out, but if you look at the Chiefs and uh, got a great tight end, uh, they got a great quarterback. I know hats off. What makes Mahomes, I think, very exciting for NFL fans is that it seems that he does so many things ad lib, off the cuff. And it kind of reminds people of the old AFL. Indeed, it does remind me of the old AFL. And that's why he is fun to watch. Now, I haven't rooted for the Chiefs in every game. I have to be uh, honest. I rooted for Buffalo last year. I thought with the rules, everyone knows the rules coming in. But I, I thought that for whatever being, whoever came up with the overtime rule last year in the NFL, of course, they rethought the rule, and I still think it's kind of crazy uh, how they do it. Nevertheless, it is an improvement, but of course, uh, Buffalo was denied potentially going to the Super Bowl last year. Buffalo losing again to uh, Buffalo losing this year uh, to Cincinnati, and now Cincinnati gets to play again the Kansas City Chiefs, and it should be a great game. You know, Burrow. He probably had the greatest Heisman Trophy season of all time. And why I can make a bold statement like that, he was unbeaten. He won a national championship. He won the most games of any collegiate uh, quarterback to win a championship. I mean, he won 15 games, and basically he won playoff games. Not only that, but if you ever take a look at the schedule that LSU played that year, they defeated about four or five, maybe even six ranked teams. Not only that, but his game against the ranked teams was much better than the, the games against the unranked, meaning that he really stepped up his game. Well, Burrow is a winner. May not be the most talented quarterback in the league, but he's definitely a winner. And that's why uh, I, I'm really... Lay, you know, spending so much time with this particular game, Kansas City and Cincinnati. I, I, I don't think it will be a dud. I'm praying it's not going to be a dud because I'm looking forward to it. And uh, you, you, you're, you have uh, right before you two great quarterbacks. I don't think there's any denying that Mahomes is a great quarterback. Like I said, he's probably the most exciting. Actually, I would even say this. I don't think people would argue with this. He's probably the most exciting player in the NFL. I, I think it's it's really um, hands down. It's Mahomes and Burrow. Problem with Burrow is that Cincinnati seems to get off the late starts, and, and he seems to be that undiscovered talent that's lying out there in the Midwest for whatever reason. And uh, you know, you know, Mahomes gets all of the the ink uh, because he is just, you just never know what he's going to do on any play. So I am looking forward to that. That's why I have the back. Uh, Chiefs, the Kansas City, one of the true logos I love on the helmets of the NFL. I do love the old uh, the Kansas City Chiefs uh, logo. I would love to do You know, I might do a Super Bowl special again on some of my favorite team emblems and mascots because the Chiefs have a really good one. What I really loved about uh, this is that Kansas City promoted themselves not just as a team for the city of Kansas City, but they also promoted themselves as a team for Missouri. And of the region, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Missouri, Iowa, 
Kansas and Nebraska. I always thought that was cool as a kid. I still do that. They say, all right, we're taking this region in and we're going to represent you. Now, I don't know how many Oklahoma uh, people actually root for Kansas City because I'm sure that the Dallas Cowboys with their successful franchise has drawn even most rabid anti-Texas Oklahoma fans, uh, drawn them to the Dallas Cowboys. Anyway, that should be an exciting game. And uh, the Philly, San Francisco, it should be interesting because Brock Purdy has done such an outstanding job coming in uh, for the injured Garofalo. And uh, the Eagles looked for a while there that they were going to be a buzzsaw, uh, 14-3. and And I will tell you this, beating the Giants the way they did, Again, antenna went up, uh, and I was thinking about this. They always tell you beating a team three times in a season is pretty difficult to do. Well, I did some research. I was able to actually put the test, uh, the question into the, my computer the right way, and I got a great website that answered it for me without me doing as much digging as I normally do. But I was looking and it stated that since the merger, 24 times has one team beaten another team three times, meaning that they have to beat them in the playoffs. And that prior to the uh, the Giants losing for the third time to the Eagles, that the last time it happened was 2004 when Seattle defeated the, uh, the Rams three straight. All right. And unfortunately for the Giants, listen, let's be fair. Giants didn't beat a lot of good competition. They did what they had to do to get into the playoffs. Right? They still won 10 games. They did far better than anybody, including this quote-unquote pundit right here, thought they could do. I didn't even think they were going to be 500. I am sure that many Giant fans at the beginning of the year wanted to see uh, Barkley go just so they could get more draft choices because not that they don't like Barkley, uh, but they were thinking this, we're only going to win three, four, maybe five games. We might as well uh, trade Barkley uh, a pretty good piece to have on a potential championship team and get some draft choices for them. Well, fortunately for the Giants, they did get them and they got them into the playoffs. Now, do I think the Giants going forward can get to the playoffs next year? Yeah. Will it be probably more difficult? Probably. But they do have some pieces there that can get them better. And uh, I guess bright things are looking for, for Big Blue. Problem with the Giants seems that they are uh, punished by playing in one of the toughest divisions. How could I say that? Well, you had Dallas, the Giants, Philadelphia all make the playoffs. And uh, Washington was almost there. All right, so you had three teams make the playoffs. Not bad for a conference. Uh, that being said, I just want to, I promised last week, you know, I was doing a little special about Martin Luther King and second players into the league and all the rest of it, but I never hit really on Jackie Robinson. And I just wanted to say this. Uh, one of the things I always liked about Jackie Robinson was that not only was he a great baseball player, now, to be fair, I know a lot of people out there are going to say, ah, eh, his, his stats aren't all that good and all the rest of it when you compare him to other players. you got to remember, Jackie Robinson came up as a much older player. So right there, he's not coming up as a 22-year-old. Uh, he's coming up as a man of 28. I think he was maybe 28 years old. But um, his war was only 63.8. But to be fair, and of course, everyone knows how I feel about war. It can be... An interesting stat, I like to use war against or to prove an argument against it, actually, if you know what I mean. Uh, but he came up with Brooklyn as a 28-year-old, which is kind of old. You know, the great players come up as 19, 20 year We'll talk about that, too. Uh, you know, Mantle, Mays, Aaron did come up. Yes, they came up later, obviously, than Robinson, but they came up at a younger age, which gives you... Uh, three, four years to improve and adjust and all the rest of it. But, you know, Robinson does win the Rookie of the Year in his first year, 1947. His 12 homers, 48 RBIs. He stole the most bases in the league. 
got caught, but he still had a 75%. Here's the big thing with Robinson. He hit a solid 297. Ready for this, guys? Only struck out 36 times. Game was so different then. Heck, 36 times for Aaron Judge is in one week. And that's not a knock against Judge. That's just the way that things are being played today in Major League Baseball. They don't poo-poo the strikeout anymore. It's no big deal. It used to be an embarrassment for the players to strike out, uh, especially in 100, you know, at 100K uh, pace, unless you were a big thumper like a Willie Stargell. Um, but anyway, or a Reggie Jackson. We'll get into him in a couple minutes. Uh, that year he hit 297. He had an incredible uh, on-base percentage. He drew 74 walks. And Robinson, really, he would have been an outstanding player, not just then, but even today, because he is the metrics guy for many of the GMs. Hits for has great power in a lot of ways. Uh, hit a ton of doubles in his career. Good, solid power for an infielder. Uh, would average 15, you know, 15 home runs. I don't think he ever hit 20 in a year. No, he didn't. His high was 16. Drove in a ton of want runs off those 16 home runs that year. He had 124 RBIs and hit 342. And I'm talking about the year 1949. So at age 30, he's having that kind of a season. Uh, but Robinson, ready for this, 38 doubles that year, 12 triples, 16 homers. 342 average, 86 walks. That would just send up signals for any GM today. So when I look at his 63 war, had he played maybe from the age of 21, 22, I'll even say this. Suppose he started only four years earlier. I guarantee you his war, he is in the Hall of Fame, his war would probably be somewhere in the 80s, maybe even higher. And um, yeah. I'm just telling you, I would even say this. Had he come up at the age of 21, probably his war would be in the hundreds. That's how good a player he was. And people don't realize this. He played almost every infield position. Starts off at first base to avoid any kind of controversy. Eventually moves to third. He actually only retired from the game because he did not want to play for the Giants. His rival, bitter rivals, cross down rivals, all the rest of it. So he retired from the game. But he always played with grace and dignity. And he was just a great all-around athlete. He goes to UCLA, plays, I believe, football, track, and basketball in addition to baseball. That's unheard of today. Maybe you'll see a two-sport athlete today. But Robinson was all four. Incredible. So he could run. He could field. He could hit. He could hit with power, and um, he could play defense. The only thing I don't really know, uh, he had to have a pretty good arm too, by the way, because in order to turn the double play, your arm's got to be at least solid, all right? Maybe not the cannon of a Clemente or a Maze, but certainly good enough to be able to turn the double play with Pee Wee Reese and Gil Hodges and all the rest of it over there. All right, now let's turn to... Uh, my next cartoon, and uh, I like this one in particular. I'll read it. Sal Bando passed away last week or earlier. Um, yeah, a couple of days ago. So here's the cartoon. Hmm. We still need a power-hitting third baseman who can get on base, play solid D, and in a nutshell, is a winner. We just got him, Sal Bando. And in a nutshell, I think that's how you should interpret Sal Bando. And I guarantee you that I, I didn't know this. Do you know he, he at one point ranked second in the American League behind Brooks Robinson, all-time home runs for a third baseman. He ended his career with 242 home runs. Played solid, maybe not gold glove defense. He does finish with a positive uh, from the defensive metrics for a third baseman. Um, hit 20 home runs a few times. Drove in a ton of bases. Do you realize that he was actually, I think more than anything that embodies uh, Sal Bando. Let me, just get, let me just get a picture of Bando here. Why do you want to look at me when Bando was the player? Actually, this one is a really good picture. 
of Bando and his cohorts, uh, 1972 A's All-Stars. You have Sal Bando, you have Campy Campanaris, Ken Holtzman, Jim Hunter, Jim Catfish Hunter, uh, Reggie Jackson, Joe Rudy, and Dick Williams, <clears throat> who would be on to coach the team. Remember that in 71, it would be Earl Weaver. And then usually he picked uh, maybe a, uh, the two coaches who were either in first place or that he felt as friends. So he took uh, um, Dick Williams. And, of course, Dick Williams would win his first World Series that year with the A's and then a second one in 73. And, of course, how can you not? Now, I wasn't crazy about the logo, but as the years have gone on, I've come to appreciate the logo because – of the white shoes, and it was called the Swinging A's because they did trans, uh, they did in many respects transform baseball in the way that we look at it today. It is definitely more of a, a colorized game, courtesy of Charlie Finley, who uh, has long been scorned by baseball, by the traditionalists, by uh, the sports writers, all thinking he was kooky, crazy, and out of his mind and all the rest of it. Let me tell you something. Charlie Finley, and this is what we're, we're, we're heading for. Charlie Finley knew how to build a ball club, or at least those A's teams. And had he, and actually it was Charlie Finley, ready for this, who Marvin Miller most feared. Because when the age of free agency, after the, uh, Supreme, uh, the, the judge ruled that Catfish Hunter was a, a free agent. And after he actually ruled with McNally, I think it was Peter Seitz, Judge Peter Seitz, ruled that Dave McNally of Baltimore and Andy Messersmith of the uh, L.A. Dodgers were free agents, that uh, the bonds that the baseball institution could no longer have on the baseball players. And, of course, it was first pushed by Kurt Flood, who should be in the Hall of Fame. Um, but... Charlie Finley was the guy who said, oh, you want to end this free agency and all these high high price salaries and the players want their freedom? You know what? Give everybody, a, uh, make everybody a free agent every year. And of course, his point was this, that if you had, and this is something that Marvin Miller didn't want because what Marvin Miller was hoping for and did get was that you get that one or two premier players from one position. And then the teams basically in an auction for their services. If you had all 12 third basemen at the time, or all 24 third basemen at the time, because I'm talking about two leagues, uh, the price or the value of their contracts would not go up as uh, really exponentially. It wouldn't rise as fast, which was what Miller was hoping for. Instead, okay, you don't want this? I'll get another third baseman to plug in, and then next year I can try for you. Kind of like what you guys do who play fantasy baseball. Very rarely do you keep or hold on to players. Every In many of the leagues, it's it's a free agency every year. So you redraft players. All 600 and some odd players are open for draft. And of course, you know that the value of the players is not as high. In fact, if you spend too much on a player, it can hold you. Um, it can really put you or, or, or fetter you. Uh, in, in your pursuit of other players. Anyway, Charlie Finley actually wanted them uh, to be free agents every year. And he felt, and probably rightfully so, we'll never see it, that if you did give everyone free agency, uh, the prices wouldn't have gone up. But here's why I wanted to talk about the A's. And I do have some research now, albeit it's probably nothing new. I'm sure that Bill James has talked about this. I know Bill James has talked about uh, the importance of of walks. He's uh, talked about, I say, the importance of home runs in terms of winning a championship and all the rest of it. So what I was trying to do is this. The A's, when we talk about the 70s, very rarely do, the A's, do people say, hey, it's really the decade of the Oakland Athletics. Well, first of all, uh, very often they go to my team, one of my, one of my, my teams, the Cincinnati Reds. But, you know, the Reds only won two championships. They were back-to-back, -back, and they lost to the A's. Then people might say, okay, what about the Los Angeles Dodgers maybe being a dynasty team? Okay, 
They won one championship, got beat twice by the Yankees, and got beat by the Oakland A's in the 74 World Series. Actually, the last hurrah for that A's club. And then, of course, you have the Miracle Mets in 69 who took the A's to the final game. Could have won that game, but nevertheless went down to the A's. You're not talking about three straight divisions. You're talking about the A's winning a division 71, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And just missing out in 1976 after most of their players or many of their players were gone. Hunter, Jackson, all right, Holtzman, and finishing only a few games behind the Royals. All right. So they have five divisions. They had three pennants. And they had three World Series championships. Interestingly enough, two of the three going to seven games. And one of the teams that they do beat is seen as the greatest team of the decades or, or of the 70s. All right. Now, to be fair to the Yankees, they won twice, 77 and 78. They get their, um, try to get there back in 79, don't. 76, of course, they do win the pennant, but get beat by the Reds. And as I say, the Reds got to, the 70 World Series got beat by the Orioles. They got to the 72 World Series, got beat by the Oakland A's. They got to the 75 and 76. They win those. They do win another pennant in 78, or excuse me, 79, but then that's it for the Reds. By then, too, 78, many of their players were gone. Perez to a trade, Rose to uh, the Phillies, courtesy of free agency, and many of the other players are gone. Now, so here's what I was looking at. Those A's teams, I can't really, ready for this, I can't, first of all, Hunter Fingers Jackson are the only Hall of Famers on that team of those three years, okay? So what I was looking for was this, why are the Oakland A's champions three straight years? Now, okay, three Hall of Famers, one of course is a relief pitcher, one of course is a stud starting pitcher who many people say, well, he really benefited from playing in Oakland, Alameda with the big foul territory. Okay, great. But you know what? If you're taking advantage of your environment, why are you being penalized for that, right? Um, they also had a couple other solid pitchers. So I'm just going to try to go through this. And I think here's the reason why the A's won. I don't believe they had any gold, gold glove winners. Bando, of course, comes up. Do you realize that in 69, Bando, with, um, and it wasn't a write-in, and it wasn't the fans voting, but Bando, ready for this, is the starting third baseman in the 69 All-Star game played in Washington. Now, Brooks Robinson had been the starter for five straight years prior to 69. He was regarded as the third baseman in the American League. I know other players had started before him. Frank Malzone started for uh, from the Red Sox, started, I think, uh, the year before Robinson makes that. And then right after Robinson, he starts the 70. Uh, no, he didn't start 70. Harmon Killebrew did. 71, 72, and I believe 73. But basically, it was Robinson's hot corner to start almost every All-Star game. Yet, Sal Bando, of all people, breaks through. And here's why I've thought that is such – uh, so impressive. Like I said, the fans weren't voting, so there wasn't a stuffing of the ballot boxes. It's number one. Number two, Washington, Baltimore. I I'm thinking the area. There might be a, a quite a bit of sentiment to have uh, Brooks Robinson play there in front of basically uh, the Maryland, Washington, Virginia, Delaware area fans. And then number three, uh, Oakland, of course, was really – Think of it, had just been in Oakland for two years, were just coming into uh, really maturity as a ball club. Meanwhile, here's Baltimore coming off the 66 World Series win, which was a, um, a sweep of the Dodgers. And of course, Brooks was the 64 MVP. My whole point is that the Baltimore Orioles were really uh, in the uh, – in the middle of their great, great run. Of course, they've won in 69, 70, and 71, the pennant. They win the World Series. 
they win their divisions, etc. So I just thought it was kind of um, kind of unique and kind of really a testament to how well respected Bando was. And I don't think really, when you think about it, here is Bando in his career. All right, he comes up. He actually went to Arizona State. Number of players, Rick Monday, Reggie Jackson, and Sal Bando find their way to Oakland, courtesy of Arizona State. I think that does, I, I'm telling you, that does really help them, even though Monday isn't there for the World Series teams. He comes up in 69, ready for this. One thing about Bando, he was solid and he played every day. He led the league in games played four times. Three times he played everything, 162. And then in 75, he played 160. Now, was he a masher like a Jackson? No. Or a Schmidt? No. Would you say that he's a, a, an equivalent of Schmidt? No. Schmidt, you'd have to say, is, let's say, an A-plus player. I would probably put Bando as a B-plus as a high, but a solid B-plus. But here's where Bando, do you realize that in back-to-back -back years, Bando would have been a great metrics player today. He drew 111 and 118 walks in back-to-back -back years, 69 and 70. I've maintained that probably 69 was his greatest season. He had 31 taters that year. Whoop, taters. I never use that term. 31 homers, had 113 RBIs, 25 doubles, had 111 walks. Ready for this? Hit a solid 281. And But his on-base percentage was was 400. Now, his on-base percentage was uh almost was 98 points higher than his uh batting average, 254 to 352. Okay. So you have a solid, not great defensive player at third base. Now I'm looking at this. This A's team, and I just used 1974. I'm going to say this. The A's in 72. Let me just go over this. Oh, I got so much material here on, on the A's this way. They were courtesy of baseball reference. They were 23 and 26 in 1972 in one run games, nine and nine in extra, but in blowout games, which is where you win by five or more, 22 and four. And in fact, they were second in runs scored in, 19, in 1972, all right, behind the Red Sox. And uh, the league average, they scored. Um, they had five, I believe they had um, 640 runs, and the league average was 537. Let me just check that real quick. I know that they were second in the league. Uh, the A's scored, I'm sorry, they scored 604 runs to finish behind 640 by the Red Sox, but they do finish second in the league. But in the blowout games, whew, it was just incredible. All right. They were 98 runs higher in the uh, blowout games, I do believe. Okay. Um, in 73, now, runs jump because uh, it's the first year of the DH. In one-run games, they improved to 27 and 21. And remember, in 72, they do win the World Series. One-run games, they improve, really, by four, uh, by about, Nine, well, you could say about four and a half games they improved by. They go 27 and 21. Solid. Solid. And in blowout games, they still win 22, but now they're getting blown out more. They go 22 and 14. Extra inning games, like I said, nine and six. They lead the league in runs. And I think what they did was this. I can argue this. In 72, the A's and the Red Sox, uh, they get guys who played for, well, I'll, I'll tell you this. Darren Johnson was their DH in 1973. All right. He wasn't probably in the same realm as Orlando Cepeda, although he has similar stats to Cepeda. And of course the Orioles who they would play would have either Lee May or a number of other guys. All right. Uh, they would eventually settle on Tommy Davis, and we talked about him. Tommy Davis was a pretty good DH for them. But um, that A's team also uh, wins the World Series uh, and, and wins it in four games out of you know beats the 
the, the Mets four games to three. 74. They're four and five in extras. One run games are 25 and 28. So they fall back on that. And in blowouts, though, they improve the 30 and 11. Now, they uh, averaged actually 6.9 runs in blowout games. They are third in runs scored that year behind Texas and Boston. Uh, Boston finished at 696, Texas 690. The league average was 665. They only scored 24 more runs than the league average. But they were second in home runs. Oh, excuse me. I'll even say this. In 72, they were first in home runs. They were tied for fourth in 1973 in home runs. And in 1974, they were second in home runs, trailing the White Sox by only three. But to be fair to the White Sox, remember, they lose Dick Allen for like half the season. And who knows? Maybe the margin might have been a little bit higher, maybe 150 to 132. Regardless. All right. One reason I think that they won, they'd finish in the top four or five in runs scored. They finished no lower than fourth in home runs. So they're almost guaranteed at least a run. And here's what I started to find out. The old axiom that um, Earl Weaver likes to talk about. Pitching, defense, three-run home runs. Well, remember how I did one on the Orioles that year? And it really didn't come to fruition with their big boppers, Robinson, Frank and Brooks, and Boog. However, ready for this? In 1974, so I'm taking the final uh, uh, year, and it would be the final year probably. Um, actually, when I think about it, it would be Oakland's final year in the le- as the real power because even though they compete the following year, it's not the same uh, Oakland A's team. But let me just do this. 1974. Let me get in here. That's it. Jeff Burrows, of course, is the MVP. We can talk about that another day. Ready for this. Uh, Rudy hits 22 home runs. Bando hits 22 home runs. Jackson hits 29. And Gene Tennis hits 26. So you got four guys hitting over 80 80 home runs. Actually, a little bit more than that. Uh, 99. (laughs) 99 home runs. Not 100. 99. Okay, ready? Um of the total number of home runs that the team hit, I was just doing a quick thing of the 132 home runs. Ready for this? Two run home runs hit by not Jackson or Bando. So we're just going to keep that. Uh, they had six, 13 two run home runs, three run home runs. They had eight by the uh, other other players on the team. Grand slams. Bando had one. Gene Tennis actually had three. And Rudy had two. So you're talking about six. You're talking about six of their 132 home runs. Six, seven, uh, 12, 13, 19, 25, 27. 27, 132 that were not Jackson or Bando were home runs with at least one man on base. And, of course, this is the axiom that uh, Weaver likes to talk about. Real quick, because I I do want to center this on Bando. In 1974, Jackson hit 29 home home runs. Of those, ready? 11 were only solo, and he had no grand slams. Jackson had 11 two-run homers. Or, or, uh, yeah, two-run homers, 22 RBIs. And he had seven three-run home runs. That's 18 home runs with men on base. More than half. And if you think only Jackson did this, ready for this, Bando had 22 home runs. He had, ready for this, only eight solo shots, meaning that the other 14, 10 were with one man on base. And three were with two run, uh, runners aboard, and he hit one grand slam. Now, what does that tell me? Again, 14, you're talking about 14 and um, 18. That's that's uh, 32 plus what I said, 29 before. Guys, that's over, that's over half of their home runs were with runners on base. They were really living out what Earl Weaver had claimed. 
It's getting over 50, almost 50% 50 of your reduction with, with runners on base. I think that's one of the reasons why they won three straight. The other thing was this. We talk about the Yankees real quick having the core four. Well, what do you think the A's had in 72, 73, and 74? Now, to be fair, the A's trade Rick Monday in 1971 uh, from center field. He goes, but it's, a, it's probably their best deal that they make because they acquire Holtzman, a solid lefty, who goes on and wins. Ready for this? Yeah, 72, he wins 19. 73, he wins 21, so that's 40. And then he wins 19 and 74, and then 18 and 75. So, pardon me, he won 77 games in four seasons for the A's. Um, and in a nutshell, here's what I want to tell you. Where we talk about the core four for the Yankees, ready for this? Oakland didn't have a core four that they were able to keep together for those three years. They had a, really a core seven because they had Campy, Mando, Hall of Famer Jackson, Joe Rudy, Ken Holtzman, Hall of Famer Ken uh, Jim Catfish Hunter, and Hall of Famer Fingers, who they relied on. They were um, really solid. Rarely did they get injured. I think the guy who missed the most games was probably Reggie Jackson the one year. And what I was saying about uh, Rick Monday is that he is traded off, but I never realized this. Jackson played a ton of games in center field for the A's. Truly, this was a team of parts that became so mo so dominating when you put all those parts together. Campy, Bando, Jackson, Rudy, Hunter, Holtzman, and Fingers. This is Willow Tool for another edition of Park Ridge Sports History. Thanks very much for watching. I'll be here next week with another edition. Bye now.